40% of the marks in GCSE Science are for pure factual recall. I've written a series of questions so you can test whether you have memorised the key facts from specification. This is a revision video with the answers to the questions for just the triple biology content in Unit 5. You can find a link to the worksheet with the questions in the description below. The previous video covers the combined science content, which you also need to know if you're taking triple biology. At the top on the right is the cerebral cortex. The structure labelled underneath this is the cerebellum. At the bottom on the left as part of the brainstem is the medulla. And then this small structure here is the hypothalamus, and that's where the thermoregulatory centre is found. Conscious thought is controlled by the cerebral cortex. Voluntary muscular movement, such as walking, is controlled by the cerebellum whereas the medulla controls automatic movement like your lungs breathing or your heart beating. The overall temperature of the body is controlled by the thermoregulatory centre in the hypothalamus. Neuroscientists can study the brain using MRI scanning by studying patients with brain damage or by electrically stimulating parts of the brain to see what happens. It's difficult to investigate the brain function for a whole range of reasons. Firstly, there's a lack of patients, so while it's really useful to look at patients who have a particular part of their brain damaged, those patients might not exist and it would be extremely unethical to create them. Generally speaking, the ethics of experimenting with brains are really, really tricky. The brain is also quite difficult to access on account of you having a skull, um, and there are many functions that are controlled by lots of different parts of the brain, so it can be really hard to pin down which particular group of cells is responsible for a particular function. Also, when somebody has a problem with their brain, there's a wide range of things that could be wrong. It could be part of their mental health or it could be part of an infection, as well as gross issues with part of the brain having been damaged. The first part of the eye is called the sclera, and at the front where this becomes transparent, we call it the cornea. This is responsible for protecting the eye and also for focusing the light. On the outside of this is a membrane called the conjunctiva, and this is the part that can become inflamed when you have conjunctivitis. The hole that allows light into the eye is called the pupil, and the size of this hole is controlled by a coloured muscular ring called the iris. Behind the pupil and the iris is the lens, and this is also responsible for focusing light, and it can change shape to determine where the light focuses. The shape of the lens is controlled by the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligaments. The light is focused so that it lands on the retina where the photosensitive cells are, and then signals from these are passed to the brain by the optic nerve. The cornea focuses the light and also offers protection to the eye. The lens focuses the light more finely and it's able to adjust its size in order to determine exactly where that light focuses. The iris is responsible for controlling the size of the pupil, which is how the light enters the eye. The retina, or the rods and cones, which are the cells in the retina, detect light. Signals from the rods and cones travel to the brain along the optic nerve. The rods are more sensitive to light, but the cones detect colour. When there's a bright light, your pupil narrows. This happens because the radial muscles in the iris relax and the circular muscles contract. Accommodation is the process of the lens changing shape in order to make sure that the light that reaches your eye from a near object or a far object still focuses on the retina. In order to focus the light from a nearby object, the ciliary muscles need to be contracted and therefore the suspensory ligaments need to be relaxed and this leads your lens to be short and fat. If you look at something that's far away, then the opposite happens. So the ciliary muscles relax, the suspensory ligaments contract, and the lens is tall and thin. Myopia is short-sightedness, whereas hyperopia is long-sightedness. In myopia, the light focuses before it reaches the retina, and this happens because the lens is too fat. Whereas in hyperopia, the light focuses beyond the retina because the lens is too thin. Either one of these could be caused by a problem with the lens, but also a problem with the ciliary muscles or the suspensory ligaments. In order to treat these with spectacles, you treat myopia with a concave lens and hyperopia with a convex lens. If you don't want to wear glasses, then you could also have contact lenses, laser surgery or lens replacement. Body temperature is regulated by the thermoregulatory centre, or TRC, in the hypothalamus in the brain. There are temperature sensitive receptor cells in both your brain and in your skin. If the temperature gets too hot, then you may vasodilate, in which case you flush and turn pink, and you may start sweating more. It's really, really important that you say more because you are sweating a tiny amount all of the time and they won't give you the mark if you just say sweating. 
If the temperature gets too cold, then you may vasoconstrict, you may shiver, and also the hairs on your body may become erect. If you're taking higher tier, then you need to be able to describe how these changes help to regulate your body temperature. So, when you vasodilate, the blood travels through blood vessels that are closer to the skin. The blood vessels that you have aren't moving, the blood's just being shunted into a second set of vessels. And because these are closer to the skin, that's going to allow more heat loss. When you sweat, the sweat absorbs the heat from the skin and evaporates, and this also helps you to cool down. When you vasoconstrict, the blood travels through vessels that are further away from the skin and therefore less heat is lost. When you shiver, your muscles contract, they respire more and therefore they release energy, warming you up. And when your body hair becomes erect, it traps air and this helps to insulate you. You lose water by exhaling, by sweating and by excretion through the kidneys. You have no control of the amount of water or indeed salt that you lose when you exhale or when you sweat. So it's only the excretion through the kidneys that you can control. It's important that water levels in the body remain constant in order to avoid osmotic shock and damage to cells. When you digest proteins, these are broken down into amino acids. These are then deaminated to make ammonia, which is converted to urea because it's less toxic. This is then filtered out by the kidneys. The kidneys help to control levels of water by the selective reabsorption of water in the nephron according to signals from the brain. ADH is antidiuretic hormone, a diuretic being something that makes you urinate more, so antidiuretic being something that stops you from urinating so much. It's released by the pituitary gland, although it's made by the hypothalamus. It acts on the nephron of the kidney, and when it's released, it reduces the water loss into the urine by ensuring that the kidney selectively uptakes more of the water. If a person's kidneys stop working, they could be treated by an organ transplant or by kidney dialysis. Dialysis is the artificial filtering of the blood in order to remove urea. If you have a kidney transplant, then one of the advantages is that that new kidney can work continuously. This means you don't have to spend hours each week in a hospital. It's also a long-term solution, provided the issue was something like an injury to your kidneys rather than a long-term disease that could cause the new kidney to fail, then once you have the kidney transplant, you should be able to have a normal quality of life. In contrast, one of the advantages of dialysis is that there's no need for surgery, which could potentially be dangerous. There's also no need for you to take immunosuppressant drugs to prevent you from rejecting the new organ. And there's no need for a donor to be found. Also, dialysis might be more appropriate if you have a short-term infection rather than long-term damage to your kidney that isn't going to heal on its own. Phototropism is the growth or orientation of a plant in response to light whereas geotropism is the same orientation or growth in response to gravity. Either one of these could be positive if you're growing towards it or negative if you're growing away from it. When a shoot encounters light, light will cause auxin to break down and this leads there to be more auxin on the dark side of the shoot. Auxin promotes growth in the shoots and this means that the dark side will grow more so the whole shoot will bend towards the light. In the roots, the bottom side of the root will contain more auxin, and in roots, auxin inhibits growth, which means that the upper side of the root will grow more, so the whole root will bend towards gravity. By promoting uncontrolled growth of a weed so that it uses up all of its resources, auxins can be used as weed killers, but also in smaller amounts in rooting powders and to promote the growth in tissue culture. Gibberellins initiate seed germination. They can be used commercially to end seed dormancy, promote flowering and increase fruit size. Ethene is responsible for controlling cell division and fruit ripening, so it's used commercially to control the ripening of fruit during storage and transport. For instance, we can transport fruit that is still green and unripe, and then when it gets to the supermarket, then it can be sprayed with ethene in order to ripen it. In the required practical, you needed to investigate the impact of light on seedling growth. So firstly, you would set up some identical petri dishes with the same nutrient medium or potentially cotton wool and the same number of seeds in them. These should be subjected to the same conditions. So for instance, they should have the same amount of water each day. Then one petri dish goes in the light and one goes in the dark and you observe the differences. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this useful in your revision for GCSE Biology Unit 5. If you did find it useful, let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe so that you receive notifications for the rest of these recall question videos.